Dr. Stephen Vasquez, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Good to be here. Good to be here. Well, it's, yeah, it's good to have you here. I want to welcome you to the show. I heard about your work from listener Shel Stein, who -hmm. suggested you'd make a good guest for the show. So once again, welcome. Okay. So let's start out with you telling us a bit about your background and how you got drawn into becoming a psychotherapist. Oh, um, I was a professor of psychology and sociology for a local uh, university um, college in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for a few years. Okay. And then I got my credentials in counseling, licensed professional counselor, licensed marriage and family therapist, um, way back in the 80s, uh, early 80s, even late 70s, some of it. Um, So I've been in practice 38 years, mainly in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, but I moved to Austin, Texas for one year now. So I'm in a new environment in that sense. Um, I've been... um, practicing this approach for some time. I have two different approaches that I originated. Um, This one, emotional transformation therapy, referred to as ETT, uh, developed in the early 1990s, and it's it's evolving over time. For those people who've been trained just as, as recently as five years ago, they're outdated because it keeps evolving with uh, newer, better strategies. Um, it's, it's unusual in that um, it's uh, extremely fast. It shifts emotional distress within seconds sometimes and sometimes within minutes. So this is a, a new really paradigm for counseling psych- psychological activities. Um, but it does much more than that. Um, I've written three books on it. I've taught mm-hmm. it in eight, eight different countries now. And we've trained hundreds of people to do this process around the country in certain areas. And I have several teachers that do most of the teaching today. Um, so my, my three books uh, have been the, all about ETT. So um, how I came about it was- uh, Do you remember the three titles just off the top of your head? Sure, well, I happen to have one right here, isn't that handy? One of them is simply called Emotional Transformation Therapy. Looks like this. Um, okay. And the second one is called um, Accelerated Ecological Psychotherapy. Okay. And um, the third one is just out this year. I don't have a copy of it right now. It's called Spiritually Transformative Psychotherapy. And it just came out this year. We've got a lot to talk about then. (laughs) The the one that I knew about was the uh, Emotional Transformation Therapy. Yeah, that's the premise. And and I, I don't have... I don't have any of those books somehow, mm-hmm. but, uh, but we can discuss it in, in depth here. Mm-hmm. Um, what would be your short, we'll go into it in depth, but what would be your short description of ETT? Yeah, ETT is a um, attachment-based um, form of interpersonal therapy that whose outcomes are vastly accelerated by visual brain stimulation. So that's my one sentence, what it okay. is. That's a good one. <laughs> okay. And, and Sh- Shell Stein, who I mentioned before, uh, he sent me an article that you wrote titled An End to Addictions. So that's primarily what I'm drawing from. Okay. Uh, is, ET, is ETT primarily used to treat addiction? No, actually the addiction protocol was only developed the last few years, uh, but its success was so unusual. Uh, That article you read was one that was published in the, by the American Psychotherapy Association in the fall of 2016, so it's not that old. Um, But with addictions, most everybody that has addictions has what we call co-occurring disorders they're not just simply addictions. They also have trauma. They may have depression. They have anxiety. They have a variety of things that go along with the addiction and addiction is part of it. Um, So most people that treat addictions have to treat a variety of other things that come with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it varies from person to person what that is that's a company, but it's very different from a person that has um, addiction maybe to alcohol and uh, they have no significant psychological issues before that and you have other people have been through 
lots of inpatient treatment, they have borderline personality, they have all kinds of things, and they are addicted. Now, that's a different animal. It's more complicated mm -hmm. to treat. Mm -hmm. And so actually I've treated, developed all the other strategies for trauma, depression, anxiety disorders, all these things. And then the addiction thing came clear to me in the last several years, although I had successfully treated it from time to time. And as early as 1999, I treated a, a sexual addiction, an addict that was a uh, pedophile, wanted to have sex with young girls. And it was almost against my will that I did this because a, a colleague of mine wanted me to treat him because she'd worked with him for a year. I did my work with him. And in the first session, he changed quite dramatically. Um, and so she was over there in the corner weeping as she observed this because the guy had struggled with it so long, she'd struggle with it. And I saw him a few more sessions because I wasn't sure how long it would hold or what exactly what I was doing at that time. And uh, it's been good ever since then, but I didn't have access to, to those populations. So I didn't get anybody else with sexual addictions at that time. It was a decade or so before I even did that. Same thing with alcohol. Early, about mid 1990s, I'd worked with some people with alcoholics and was successful, but I didn't really have a, a whole sort of theory about it any different than anybody else's so more recently i decided to look up the research and and within the last 10 years and really understand the whole what they call the um reward neural network in other words the brain's network for addictions and yeah. then, I, then i began to develop applications based on understanding that and i found that we were having rather striking outcomes um people that didn't have any um, relapses. They were without craving altogether. And as far as I can tell in the addiction community, that's relatively unknown. Yeah, uh, really. It's, uh, it's the two examples you've given are really surprising. Uh, they might generate some real skepticism. How, how are you going to it sounds like you're already training a bunch of people. So yeah. there are some people out there who are not skeptical, who are having good results with your right. system. And there's two inpatient programs that are now beginning to use this. One of them is really even in marketing. So I'm training an inpatient facility staff for it. But it's different in that, um, you know, I didn't come out of an addiction background. And most people that are in addictions have, have had severe addictions themselves. They've worked with years with addicts. Now, if you've done that, you've probably seen that it's very slow and there's lots of relapses and mm -hmm. craving continues for life. So the treatment is these programs that you just do, do for life. And so what happens when you're, when you're trained that way, you have a limited belief about that's how, that's the only way it can be treated. I didn't have that. And I was fortunate to see people that got over it and they didn't have any relaxes, relapses and it's, it's long, fairly many years right now. And so we don't, I'm not expecting them to have that. Um, so you came with, with fresh eyes and yeah. no preconceptions. Yes. And it's true. Uh, I'll just tell you straight out for anybody watching or listening, uh, this sounds too good to be true, but it's yeah. true. All of my work, that's my biggest uh, um, conflict I run into with my peers. <laughs> it sounds too good to be true. And uh -huh. I don't blame them. They've ha they haven't seen this. They haven't experienced it. So of course they're going to be skeptical and it's wise to be skeptical, um, but not closed. There's a difference between skeptical and closed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm willing, I do live demonstrations. I, I like to show people how it works in my trainings. Um, I ask them to bring in an addict that I've never met before and I do live demonstrations with them and then we follow them up. So, um, it's um, pretty stunning in that way. I'm going to say on the average, it's, um, it's about 10 sessions, but I've done it in one and I've done it with people that have had multiple addictions that took months and months to get it concluded because theirs was more complex than, than others. Um, but the key so is still months rather than years. That's pretty yes. dramatic. Yes, but still the odd thing in our field is that you have researchers that research addictions, and then you have therapists that work with addictions. Unfortunately, my experience has been that the two groups don't really interact, and the, that the uh, people that do 
addiction counseling aren't real familiar with the research. I'm an oddball in that I like to see what the research is, then I find, find applications for it, and I actually target the reward neural network, and the neural network in the brain that's responsible for addictions. And we, we shift that as, as what we attempt to do. So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to read a little bit from the article, uh, just a paragraph from the article that I had. Uh, you write, addictions, uh, ETT, can resolve emotional distress in minutes, which you've just been saying, and then access and resolve the related core emotional memory in a few sessions, usually resulting in permanent change. ETT can facilitate states of extreme well-being consistently in a single session. It uses an attachment-based interpersonal process whose outcomes are amplified by precise visual brain stimulation. Now, that's a new element that you haven't mentioned yet. Uh, and that ETT method uses the following four methodology, method, modalities. And uh, number one, uh, you write the spectral resonance technique is one ETT modality used to detect and change a common unobservable form of dissociation or freeze response which is not usually detectable by either therapist or the client. So let's dig into those four. That's the first one. Mm -hmm. Tell us okay. about this freeze thing that's not detectable, but somehow you're detecting it and mm -hmm. working me, with it. Let me say something first to proceed. Okay. Uh, one of the problems in treating addictions is that the underlying answers are not conscious to the client. So most therapists don't have much of a chance because the parts of the brain involved in addictions are not conscious to the client. Um, so this is called implicit memory. And so mm -hmm. it's important to have a method that can access this kind of memory. Let me give you a salient example. In my last addiction treatment course, one of, my, one of the people raised their hand, they said that they had a friend who was in a coma in the hospital. I mean, he was out unresponsive, and he would spontaneously go through the motions of smoking a cigarette while hmm. he was totally in a coma. Wow. It shows you that it's not conscious. And that shows you how deeply embedded, entrenched it is, that it will occur, the actions of it occur during a coma. So hmm. the big disadvantage most therapists have is they can't, they don't have a way to access this um, um, implicit memory you can't get it by conscious verbal dialogue it takes more to access that therefore that leads into the spectral resonance technique which is one of my best ways to access things that are not conscious to the client um, it's based on um, the concept that um, your brain uh, affects your vision depending on what's going on psychologically for example, people that are depressed often describe things around them as a looking sort of drab and, and um, not as clear or bright. So mm -hmm. that's just one example, but it, it's uh, affected by your state of mind. Now, I got a target, a visual target with extremely saturated colors. Uh, they're so, they're, you can't get it any bluer than that blue, any greener than that green. These are things that you wouldn't see in your normal visual environment. And um, so I have them lined up on this chart, these colors. And as they talk about things that disturb them, we'll, they will notice fluctuations or distortions in the way the color looks. I ask them to immediately close their eyes when that happens, because that indicates that the brain is disengaging from emotional states. So I know the second that their brain is disengaging, and it's for the most part not observable to if you're watching them. So I have them close their eyes. I ask them some present tense questions like, what's the weather like? What's the date? You know, how do your feet feel right now? Things that get them to attend in the moment. And then I have them open their eyes again. They look at it and the color is completely restored, which tells me I'm engaging them, getting them engaged again. And then we process them, have them process the emotions. And while they're engaged, the emotional processing goes 10 times faster than it would normally go because we have defenses that cause us to disconnect from our emotions whenever things are really intense 
or in plus, mm -hmm. and it's just automatic. People aren't consciously doing this. And nonetheless, in a counseling process, it interferes with their receptivity and responsiveness to what we're trying to process because basically they're not there. <laughs> it's so like a, as, as the emotional issues start to come up, they're going numb a bit, right? They're getting yeah. numb and, and you're picking that up with this. Yes. The visual visual technique the visual feedback. It, it shows up instantly. They're going numb to their emotions, but they may also go numb to their body as well. But numb, usually you think of your body, but emotions, they're disengaging and you mm -hmm. can't process an emotion if it's disengaged or maybe you can, but it'll be extremely slow. So you have that chart there that you could show us the I do. target. I could probably uh, maneuver around. It's pretty large. Uh, it would take me a few minutes to get it down. Do you let me explain a little bit more about it before we, we I do that? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, another thing that happens is that the color they're looking at will tend to expand when their emotional state is getting ready to escalate. In other words, I can tell before an emotional escalation takes place by the visual feedback, and I can help them avert that because if the visual feed, if they if they are escalating too much. You get see people get in such a state of rage or deep sadness, they can't even process emotionally because it's just completely dominated their whole thinking. They can't even think. And so I can avert either dissociation or overwhelm just by this feedback system that I have. So you might want to think of it as a form of mindfulness because it focuses you in the moment like mindfulness would, except for in mindfulness meditation, for example, you may go for hours, days, weeks, whatever, with your mind wandering, trying to get to this, this uh, place of authenticity. Here, the feedback allows us to, to make that change rather quickly. So it's a very advanced form of emotional mindfulness is what I'm referring to it as. Okay. And so all that allows us to process emotions better. Emotional transformation therapy is geared to process emotions, first and foremost. Thoughts change as a consequence of that. Physiology change as a consequence of that. But that's our primary focus. And um, so this process uh, with addicts, particularly, a third thing it does is it, it accesses things that people aren't conscious of. They find themselves spontaneously uh, remembering or talking about things that they had no conscious awareness of. And we don't have to do hypnosis to make that happen. It just happens spontaneously. That's why it's even cleaner than hypnosis because there's no suggestion. They're just looking at a color as they're talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that access is extraordinary for addicts because they, they began to remember reasons why they were drinking or smoking or whatever in the first place and what the emotions were around it. Where typically, here's what normally happens. Let's, let me use an example that happens with most people. Um, have you ever had a meal and after the meal, you thought, oh, my God, what was I thinking? Why did I eat that much? I wasn't intending <laughs> that. Most people have yeah. had that experience. Because sure. what, hap what happens in the, the reward neural network is that part of your brain that has to do with decision making and a part of your brain that has to do with memory shut down when your emotions escalate. And so you don't remember it, you go for it. You go ahead and eat the food, you know, and you may binge on it or whatever, but you've forgotten temporarily only afterwards you think what have i done and so typically that happens with addicts and so i found specific wavelengths of light that will activate that part of the brain that has to do with decision making and memory right in the middle of craving and all of a sudden you see the craving disappear because your thinking process is back intact where it isn't during the addictive uh, brain process is this making so, sense? Uh, yeah, and uh, in that list of four modalities, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is a light emitting device. Correct. So, so, but you also mentioned multi dimensional eye movement, which reminds me of EMDR. Uh -huh. And then you've got peripheral eye stimulation and light emitting device. So it sounds like you've got a lot of stuff going on with the yeah, visual they're, they're system. All Right, they all have to do with the visual system. Let me just say something about the visual system. Um, when light enters the eyes, it hits the retina, the retina converts it, uh, converts light into neural impulses that really travel 
almost throughout the whole brain. And of the 3 billion brain cells in our brain, over 2 billion of them are involved in the visually initi initiated um, neural networks in the brain. So the brain is very visual. Of our five senses, 80% of our sensory intake is visual. Mm -hmm. But the, what's different is that these visual neural networks don't just go to the part of the brain that allows us to see. They go to parts of the brain that control physiology, uh, cognition, emotion. It's in addition to just seeing, these are called non-image uh, forming um, aspects of visual stimulation. It can affect that. For example, if you looked at a big, beautiful mountain, uh, you would be affected physically as well, emotionally as well, just by looking at it. Um, mm -hmm. So the visual system has the capacity to affect almost everything, but it hasn't been harnessed until now. So I'm harnessing that in the process of the counseling process. And that's what makes it so powerful, but we haven't known how to do that before. Um, and if it's done precisely, um, I can, you may have a specific, let's say your big toe on your right foot would hurt. I can select a wavelength of light that would affect your big toe on your right foot. I'm talking about within seconds or minutes. And so, um, uh, but it's taken me some time to figure out that system. Now it's precise and sophisticated and mm -hmm. it complements and augments the, the whole interpersonal process uh, quite well. So Did you want to four see different ways that you're uh, yes. impacting the visual system? One of them is a spectral chart, which I'll show you in a minute. Yes. The other one is a form of eye movement. Uh, people are familiar with EMDR. EMDR is probably is surely the most popular, most studied form of eye movement. People know about it in our field. But there's three other forms of eye movement that have been developed since EMDR. In my opinion, and my and I'm by the way I'm trained in EMDR, but I don't use it. Um, in my opinion, the three other ones are far superior, advanced from EMDR, but they are less known. Um, and these other three methods are all individualized. The method, whereas EMDR basically uses the same method for each person. Uh, it's, it's like to me like using a hammer to build a house. Well, obviously you can build some things quite well with that, but it's limited in other things. Um, but, but if you individualize it, it's gonna be a different approach. And so mine is one of the three more advanced approaches that's been developed since the MDR and still a lot of people don't know about the other three as well. well so can you say what the other three are? Uh, one of them uh, is I think, I'm trying to remember, eye movement integration by a, a Canadian psychologist. One of them is called brain spotting, by, developed by David Grant. And then there's my approach, which is called multidimensional eye movement. and um, of course, I think mine has the most advantages or I wouldn't use it. Um, in fact, I, when I got trained in EMDR, I was trying to see if it would be useful to me. And, and most of the people that are trained in my method really had already been trained in EMDR and for the most part aren't using it anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty precise and advanced. In fact, I, got a, I have a presentation coming up at the Texas Counseling Association on this method because there's several things it does, but one of the things it does the best is um, traumatic visual experiences. For example, if you were there when you saw someone die or some kind of image that won't go away, um, mm -hmm. eye movement process I use, that is, I'm talking about things change in 15 minutes. For example, if one case, the uh, gentleman's 16 year old son hung himself in the backyard and this mm. image just wouldn't go away. And he was emotionally yeah, really. charged in about 15 minutes. It was about 90% gone as he described it. And this is, and sometimes these people have had these images for years and it ends them very fast. So the, the eye movement process can do a lot of things, emotional, physical changes. But my favorite is the way with visually fixated trauma because I don't know of anything that can do that that consistently. I haven't had it not work yet. Uh, so that's another method, that's eye movement. Peripheral eye stimulation is different, and I can show you this. I developed some goggles. These goggles, if you'll look at them, this is what it looks like from the outside. They fit over a person's face. 
Can you see this? Yeah, move them back a little bit. Back a little bit, okay. Oh, yeah. It okay, looks like they have some kind of dials on them. They do. But this is for the, it's for the therapist to turn the dial. And oh. there's little tiny openings that allow light from the environment to enter the eyes. And by controlling at what angle the light enters the eyes, it affects the brain almost instantly. Um, sometimes physical pain goes away in seconds with this process. This is particularly valuable for people that come into my office and they're just overwhelmed with emotion. They're screaming or just their, their emotion, intense, the intensity of their emotion is so high. This literally dials it down in a few minutes. Um, this is different in that it's subtle. You just have all the other ones are, are forms of visual stimulation. This is like blocking out most light, but tiny peripheral uh, angles allow a little bit of light to come in. You can't almost, almost can't even see it, but it's particularly good for people that are light sensitive. Like maybe people, it's really good. My favorite thing for this use is migraine headaches. Um, because when you have migraine headaches, you tend to be light sensitive. So this blocks out light. And so when it blocks out the light, what happens is that um, you can change each angle and the pain starts shifting. It actually, what happens is, the, let's say you may have the pain on the right side of your head as I'm doing this, it may shift to the left and then it shift to the top and different parts before it finally el eliminates. So this is more subtle, just barely lets any light in at all, but through specific angles into the eyes. In the light device, you might be able to see behind me, uh, at least where the client would be sitting. If you, can you see that okay? Yeah, I can see. Uh, I can't so, tell if, is that a box kind yeah, of that we're not, looking into? Yeah, it's, it's a cover and it has a, a lens where the light comes out from. Okay. Uh, now the light stimulation has particular value, but I would I would use the um, the spectral chart process first because I want to know if they're dissociating, and once I'm clear that they're engaged, then this works even better. But this doesn't detect whether they're engaged or not, so I have to go through step one before I would go there. This is dependent on the client being able to disclose to me exactly what's happening inside of them. Uh, what their emotional states are, the physical states. And if they can't do that, I would use a different procedure. If they can do that, I can match up precise wavelengths of light uh, to affect the state that we're targeting. So this is probably the most powerful process. However, it's dependent on the client being able to disclose exactly what's happening in, in their experience. If I get that, we can do wonders with this one. So those are the four modalities that we use. And if you want to see the chart, I don't know if I can turn this thing or, or the chart, but um, I will turn this. Uh, I mean, let me see if I can bring it over here. Just a second. It's attached in such a way that I cannot bring it over. However, basically what it is is uh, layers of colors. You may see about maybe four or five inches, a broad band of red on the bottom, a broad band of orange just above that, broadband of yellow, broadband of green, broadband of blue, broadband of, brand of uh, indigo, and then the top color is purple. So you see layered colors. But what's different is the intensity of the colors. It was produced in France, and we can't even replicate it from any place in the United States that I've found so far uh, because of the full saturation. In other words, the green is the greenest green you can possibly get. Um, mm. on a chart. And so um, that was what allows the, the effects to be so visible because any change in your brain's activity affects how the color looks. Um, so anyway, that's generally what that looks like. I'm sorry, I couldn't bring it over here. Yeah. You know, the, the, uh, the uh, results that you're talking about being so quick, the uh, the other approach that sort of makes similar claims, if you will, that comes to mind is EFT, emotional freedom technique, and all the variants of that that involve tapping on parts of your body, you know, and, and supposedly there's a, a clearing of the emotions around that. 
have you drawn on that at all? Is there some crossover between the two approaches or, or no, what? I, I went through training in that a couple of decades ago and first coming out actually with the originator of it, Roger Callahan, uh, who preceded EFT. Um, so I did experiment with that for a while. Uh, that's, I think it has a great value for self-work subsequent to a session, uh, but there's no tapping involved here necessarily. And I think the advantage with this is the access to implicit memory. Now that approach may be good at solving, reducing symptoms, but I find that this is particularly valuable for accessing things that are not conscious to the client through normal uh, verbal um, cognitive interaction. Uh, so that, that's one difference between the two. Um, and, uh, but it's, there's a variety of things you can do with these four modalities. See, most, most, most uh, methods like EMDR has one approach, EFT has another, but I have four modalities, which allows us to individualize to the person. I would be working and develop the light device first, oddly, but then I saw some shortcomings. And so the, we, the goggles came into view. Some people got overstimulated, so the goggles were less stimulating. And um, sometimes the machine the electricity went out or whatever. So then I had a chart that, that didn't require that. And so the four modalities allow us for flexibility and to individualize according to what it works. And frankly, there are some people, I don't know why one modality doesn't work, but another one does. And uh, most of the time it's pretty, all of them are fairly consistent, but people are different. And some people, the light is just not their thing. It looks too, um, it's just too much for them. Uh, just to give you an example, when I, when I took the spectral chart to a place where they were framing charts, there were two people waiting on me. One woman said, oh my God, that's beautiful. The colors are so rich. The next person said, I can't stand that. It's too bright. And it was, huh. In the store, they they epitomized the two extremes right there immediately, and um, yeah, the the way you described it, it almost sounds like it could work as a piece of art in a person's home. People are attracted to that, but yeah. the attractiveness. I, I was once sharing another office years ago in Dallas, and I asked the the other person who shared the office with me, "Can I put that up in the, in the office?" And he said, "Yes." Well, he was fine until a couple of weeks later. I I come back and it's not there. It's in the closet. And he says some of his clients complained. And uh, so, again, it's a love-hate thing. And mm. once it can't stand it, typically it's because the colors are evoking something in their brain that's surfacing that we would use therapeutically on purpose if we would do it carefully. Um, yeah. So it, that shows you its power to bring things forth. Um, yeah, I, I was impressed to see that from a theoretical perspective, uh, you draw on Bruce Ecker's work on memory reconsolidation. Uh, I've interviewed him twice here on the show, and I'm, I'm very impressed by his thinking and his work, uh, as many people are. Tell us about how his ideas fit into what you're doing. I have tried to contact him. I've been unsuccessful. I think he would love what I'm doing because... The process is accelerated in speed so fast. I use the, the concepts he talks about, memory con reconsolidation, uh, quite well. But with the visual stimulation, that process that may take weeks, we do it in a single session. And so you have permanent change in a single session at times. His process is excellent for getting permanent change of unresolved issues and inner conflicts, um, this is just a drastically sped up version of it. So I'm using the, again, the, the cognitive processes he describes, cognitive and emotional processes with the visual stimulation. So uh, I, and I cite his work wherever I um, talk about it or write about it, because I think it's, it's excellent. Um, but there's just a faster way to do it. And I know I've heard that he himself employs EMDR in the initial part of wanting to access some of the implicit memory of it. Well, this is a faster way in my experience. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I find that the information that you would utilize in that process of memory reconsolidation emerges faster this way. So yes, I've, 
I've heard him speak. I'm sorry I've failed to get in contact with him. If he's watching this, I would love to get in contact with him. Uh, just would love to show him what I'm doing with that concept. Yeah. Now, you, you're using different devices and so on. It's, a, it's an unusual, not widely known synthesis. Have you been uh, professionally attacked? Uh, has any you know, have professional said, this guy's a quack or something like that? Have you had to deal with that? I live, yes, I live in a world of uh, attacks on one side and adulation on the other side. It's kind of a strange challenge for one's ego to have to live in that blend of things. <laughs> Typically, the, imagine. the people that challenge it have never experienced it, uh, the vast majority of the time. Um, people who've experienced it are the ones that respond in a, in a positive way, like, I can't believe this is even possible to change these things that fast because you said for working with physical pain and a variety of things that you wouldn't even know it could, could be possible. So I'm just telling the truth about what our experience is. And as some people would interpret again, it, it's too good to be true. I, I get that response a lot. Um, I mean, if you've worked with addictions for years and years, you have a pretty good idea. These things are long, difficult, Lots of uh, relapses. I mean, that's your world. That's what you've learned to experience. Unfortunately, or fortunately, in my world, that's not what I've experienced. And so I have a different view. Had they experienced what I experienced, their view would be different too. But we can only go on what our experience has been. And even, even in the published literature, there's very few things that, that say what, what, I'm, what I'm observing. Um, we're trying to get the word out. And yeah. Uh, Love to, I would love to be show people who are interested in this. Um, the a lot of communities, like sometimes the addiction community, is is pretty closed. Like they have their whole way of doing it, and they think they've got it, and they're not even open to to new things. But I don't want to stereotype the whole community. Obviously, there are some that do, because I've encountered those. In fact, some of my people that trained with me have been addiction counselors for years, and. Uh, they had a real problem because they believed in me and what I did, but until they and they couldn't imagine the addiction process work until they saw it. Now they've converted and they do this work. Yeah, it's a it's a big PR problem because yeah. I'm, I'm experiencing and showing things that really people have never seen before. Uh, and you're doing uh, demos, I gather, to professional associations as a way of yes bringing people around. Any chance I can uh, have one for the Texas Counseling Association coming up in Galveston, their annual conference. And I presented at their conference last year as well. Um, last year I did one on uh, motor vehicle accident re recovery and uh, one on addictions. And oddly enough, the whole class, I did live demonstrations, but only one person was quite taken and now he's gone through the training. The other people observed the same thing right in front of them and it just doesn't how can I say they they have cognitive dissonance, even though they've seen it. Um, yeah. A woman volunteered to had a car wreck accident and her neck was stiff and so forth. It's been in pain for 20 years. We changed it in about 15 minutes in a live demo. Um, and um, so these things are usually permanent. Um, sometimes you have to do a, a series of sessions. Um, I don't claim to do everything in one session. Typically, we reduce the discomfort, whether it be physical or emotional, in the first session. And through a brief series of sessions, we make it a long-term change. Um, mm -hmm. And it, with addictions, there's a few things that have to happen. We have to have detoxification. I'm not going to tell you I can take somebody that's drunk and work with them, and they're going to be addiction-free. They have to be detoxified, for one thing. And... Um, we have a procedure where we work with motivation. We shift their motivation because almost everybody's addicted. A part of them wants to get over it and another part of them wants to consume and they're divided. So we have to work with that division early on. But the real key is detecting their dissociation because almost everybody that's addicted dissociates. Just like I gave you the example with the eating. Their decision making is compromised and their ability to remember during the addictive uh, craving is lost, at least mm -hmm. temporarily. So, um, but it's a very different beast when you can be fully cognizant in the middle of craving and um, it shifts it. 
Uh, there's more to it than that, but that's one of the things. You've got something that you call the addictive template model. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. elaborated, I think. The whole addictive approach is that is that there is a template, uh, a, a blueprint, print, as you will. Part of it is the addictive neural network in the brain. That's the basis for addiction. If you can eliminate this template, that's why there's no craving afterwards. We have people sometimes that, like say with methamphetamine, that maybe uh, a few months down the road, they will try it. And they report to us that it doesn't do the same thing for them. Even when they tried it, it's not the same. Uh, when you remove the template, the underlying causal factors, and there's usually um, a few of them, um, they're, they're, why would you relapse? There's no drive to relapse. There's no drive. To, the craving drive is eliminated at, at its source. And again, it's because we can access this implicit memory that we can find the template. Each person's template is a little different. And um, one of the things we find in the template, for example, is if you grew up and your father got stressed and he smoked, and your mother, you know, she was stressed and she took these pills over the counter or whatever. Basically, you have a role model telling you that when you're stressed, you take some kind of external source, source to solve it. And that's buried. This is from a role model. So my problem with treating, using drugs to treat drugs is that you have another authority role model that's showing you to take some substance to fix your problem, which is replicating this role model that's in the addictive template of a lot of people. And so you may solve the problem, reduce the symptoms by taking the medication, but you're reinforcing the template by an authority figure replicating what your parents did in the first place that was part of your addictive template. Is this making sense to you? Yeah, you know, what I'm thinking of is that there's this uh, major story right now about opiate addiction that's just going crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. And have you had any opportunity to try to intervene with in that kind of a situation? Because there's going to be a huge need. Absolutely. A gentleman flew down here from New York area, uh, worked with him two weeks. He's gone back. Uh, so far, this is about three months later. So far, there's no uh, return compulsions or, or uh, anything of that type yet. Uh, so uh, we're good so far. I'm watching that to see if mm -hmm. it maintains. Uh, in a lot of cases, I'm watching it. But, you know, I don't know how long to watch it because I've, I've heard tales of a, a gentleman who was uh, in prison for 42 years due to drug selling and so forth. He was addicted to a heroin. After 42 years, he gets out. First thing he does is get some heroin again. <laughs> that shows you how intact yeah. that. But these people are having a different response. Uh, one of my colleagues on the West Coast worked with a 20-year-old young man who was alcoholic, uh, addicted already. And um, after her treatment with this method, she said he would go with his buddies and they would be drinking beer. He couldn't even finish one beer, and then. He just gave it up altogether. It didn't do the same for him. And he eventually changed his friends because people look pretty silly drunk around you when you're not. And yeah, so right. he lost his interest in, it, in those friends and developed a whole new set of friends. But typically in alcohol treatment, you don't want him to go around these things. This We didn't tell him to go around it, but that's what happened. He actually did, but the interest was still at zero. So he tried to drink a little bit just to go along with it, but he couldn't finish it. And then he didn't want any more ever, period. So we're going on a couple of years now, and this gentleman still hasn't gone back to it. So we're watching it to see how long it lasts. Yeah. Now, another thing that you've looked at in terms of addiction is spirituality. And uh, you've written an article suggesting that ETT is spiritually transformative. Uh, what can you tell us about that? My third book is called Spiritually Transformative Psychotherapy. And I have a new approach in there. Um, that helps to facilitate states of consciousness of extreme well-being. Um, it's based on the contemplative approaches of meditation and like Christian-centering prayer, a lot of things along that line. Uh, the problem with those methods, uh, many counselors are advocating mindfulness meditation to go along with their counseling, which is fine. 
However, our American lifestyle does not lend itself to people fitting meditation in their daily routine. The research, shows, the research <laughs> shows that the greatest benefits are those people that use meditation daily over a long period of time. Well, Americans are very not prone to doing that. And then the roots of some of this, like mindfulness meditation, it's, it's Buddhist roots. Some people have difficulty because they're, they're not, their religion is not compatible with it in their view. So you have these two obstacles of it being incompatible religiously to them and the fact that they don't follow through, they can't fit it into the lifestyle. So they may get just a brief benefit, but they don't live it. So if we were in India, it's norm, it's the norm to meditate and you're expected to and people let you and it's, it's a part of the lifestyle. Here, that's not the case for most people. So I've developed a method using the visual stimulation to activate people's state of mind that bears a strong similarity to people who've been meditating for months or years. And we can accomplish the outcome often within a single session, although it may take me a few sessions to prepare them for such. And it's rather powerful. Uh, it helps them access the state of total mindfulness. Uh, so we avoid the issue of Will they follow up on meditating every day for whatever? And does it conflict with your religious orientation? Because I can adapt it to whatever the person's religious orientation is. Uh, but it's really- Are you saying this, this opens them up and then the, they're kind of uh, permanently uh, feeling more peace and well-being? Here's what they've described to me. Um, how long does it last? About two months on the average. But some people have an experience that they actually turn a corner. And because of the experience, they start um, moving their life in different directions. So it has a longer effect in that way. But the actual state itself, um, I mean, if you take um, alcohol or heroin or even meditate, all these things are short term. This effect seems to last on the average of about one to two months. So um it has a long, long longevity effect, but it's not like opposing to meditation. It enhances your meditation if you are already meditating, meditating, or it provides you a profound meditative experience that you don't work so hard at that you finally drop out because you know all you're hearing is your mind going over and over all these different things. Because um, the research is showing that uh, a wandering mind is not a happy mind. Uh, by killing some work, this research. They found that when people are minds are minds wander 46.9 percent of the time, even when we're doing things we like to do, and they say that there's a strong correlation between unhappiness and a wandering mind. Well, mindfulness meditation involves observing your wandering mind until you finally get to that mindfulness state. So it's um, it's a good procedure for those that can do it, but my experience with Americans is they don't do it. So I developed this other process and um, they feel this um, of variations of well-being. Um, some people who are tense and anxious, they feel a peace, a calmness. Other people who are maybe depressed, they feel a happy you know, state of well-being. Um, and so this is from having doing this light work for many years, people would spontaneously have these profound spiritual experiences and I didn't know why. So I began to start trying to figure out how this happens and how to facilitate it on purpose. And that brought about this method that I use. So, so it's, it's using this, the same tools that you use in the therapy work, but with a different orientation. Correct. When, when if that's the goal, yeah. we can do that. And yeah. uh, typically they, experience a peace that's profound beyond what they've recalled before uh -huh. uh, but it varies from person to person and so we can custom tailor it and there's no religious orientation pushed from that vantage point so you we overcome the two basic obstacles um, but the research on meditation is profound the benefits are extraordinary uh, but Americans just don't do it and yeah, I, was, I think it was on your website that I read a reference to that you yourself had a profound personal spiritual transformative experience. Is that something that you can talk about a little bit here? Sure. I've had maybe hundreds of them. 
um, starting in the in the 1970s, I started meditating at that time and uh, didn't really have any idea where it would go. Uh, but a variety of spiritual experiences happened at different points in my life. And um, uh, it's it, I was going into the field of counseling and I was trying to figure out how to integrate this. And um, I had a background mm -hmm. that taught me it wasn't, I wasn't comfortable disclosing my own personal spiritual experiences. So it took me a while to get comfortable to at least sharing, telling anybody about it per se. Um, the, many of those things are pretty odd and peculiar and people haven't had them. Just, it sounds just unusual and um, not necessarily a good unusual, but different. Um, so one of the big ones was in 1984 when I was uh, developed the capacity to heal energetically through an experience I had after a trip to the Soviet Union. And uh, so that changed my life. I actually resigned as a professor and went into private practice after that. And I also teach some forms of energy medicine uh, as a part of the counseling process. I've been a subject of studies, even one of them is a public, published studies where they were studying us as healers, what we, was going on in our mind and our experience during that experience. So that actually preceded the light work that I'm doing now with ETT. And, but, and I still do that, but uh, I wanted to find it a way that was a little bit easier for another therapist to replicate it um, than the energy healing work. Um, so that's, that led me into that, that light work. And it also led me into possibilities of things that I didn't even know were possible. Um, mm -hmm. Early on, uh, about 1987, I had this experience with a woman who was initially, she had um, seven to eight seizures per day. She was having multiple sites of physical pain and she was blind from birth. We systematically over a period of months, the seizures got down to one per month from seven or eight a day. And I wasn't working on the seizures, I was working on the stress. And as we, as we changed that, that got better. And this was before I did the light work. And then um, we worked on the sites of physical pain and those got better. Uh, and then finally one day she said, can you help me with my, get, restore my vision? She was about 45 years old and um, we were able to get her vision restored. And um, when that happened, I decided I'm never gonna limit myself about what's possible. Cause mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would have even believed that before, uh, but it turned out there was a, she was born uh, by virtue of her mother was in a car accident, a premature birth. And apparently that was related to the blindness that she had throughout her life. And as we processed that trauma and did some other energetic things, her vision came, occurred really for the first time. And so um, that's another thing that I do that I, I sort of teach separate than this light work. Yeah. Uh, so that was my awakening had to do with a lot of spiritual healing. And um, so, but I do it, I don't, uh, I'll do it with people from any faith. I don't push a particular faith on anybody. I'm open mm -hmm. to, to atheist people of faith of any type. And I try to talk to them within their belief system and only operate where they're comfortable. So you related that to a trip that you took to Russia. It, had you, were you visiting healers there or exposed yeah. to I was somebody exposed. I was exposed to healers. You have to understand the Soviet Union in the 1980s was a Cold War. And here's what would happen if you were a religious healer in the Soviet Union, which is an atheist country. Essentially, they would send a few scientists out to check you out. And if you didn't pass, you would go to prison. And if you did pass, you would be accepted. So they had rather stringent <laughs> uh, ideas about what you had to do prove in order to be a healer so obviously there weren't very many healers that were public and so I was fortunate to meet two of the most best known ones there one of them even her name was Juna even worked with um, heads of state and had been scientifically documented very fully and something about that encounter with her she didn't teach me how to do it but three days later is when this awakening took place and I think it had to do with my exposure and encounter with her. Uh, mm -hmm. Another one was in Soviet Georgia named Viktor Kravortov. So those two people had influenced me when, because um, at that time I, 
we've always heard about some magical profound, profound healer exists in the world, but it's always someplace real far away and you never see it. Well, I actually oh. had these patients, people firsthand, and that was quite um, impactful for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's another subject for another program, maybe. But yeah, yeah, I'm you know I'm interested in this because I'm uh, you know as old as you are or older and gone through a lot of the cultural countercultural transformations that we've all been through. And remember the book. Uh, Psychic discoveries behind the Iron Curtain, and have met some of the people who traveled there uh -huh. and other places, and have had profound shamanic experiences. And yeah. and yeah. Soviet areas of the Soviet Union really are have a, a deep shamanic history, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of why I'm interested and in not yes. not super judgmental about it. <laughs> You're good. Well. Um, this again, people are touchy about, is it operating within their religious parameters? So, um, you know, again, I'm, I don't push any religion. I just want to help people get better. That's, that's yeah. Basically. Yeah. No. Well, you know what? It looks like our time is about run down here. It's gone very quickly. Uh, and uh, I wonder if there's anything more that you'd like to say to, uh, to well, wrap this up. I am, we, we have a board, we have two boards um, uh, that are nonprofit boards. One supports ETT, the other specifically on research. We are looking for people, researchers to research this work. Uh, we need more documentation. I am not a researcher in my PhD program. I learned about it, but this is not what I want to do. So I want to get the word out. I need some researchers. Anybody that's interested yeah. in these novel approaches that, uh, we, they've been well tested. Lots of people use them, but we need some scientific research to document it. So that's my only plea is uh, I'm going to get the word out. If that's a possibility, if you know, if somebody knows someone who's interested, uh, we're ready to be tested and um, trying to bridge the gap between the clinical world and the, the scientific world. How can people contact you or or learn about your work? Well, like I say, they have the three books. And there's the there's the professional organization called ETTIA, Emotional Transformation Therapy International Association dot org, ETTIA dot org, or my own website, it's the ETT Center. Um, and but one of the things that throws people off is my name is last name is spelled V like in victory, A Z, not S. Z, Q U E Z. So if you're looking me up, that's where you would look. And I'm in the Austin area, and um, I'm willing and ready to um, use this for anybody it can be beneficial to. Okay, well, I've never been to Austin, but, uh, but I'd like to visit it. So I might just come knocking on your door someday to say hi. You're invited. And um, if, there's, if you want to see anything, live demonstrations, uh, I, we have a few of them on tape. And that's some at some of our websites that you can actually see, so that might be helpful. Yeah, I would like to see that. I was looking for you on YouTube. Uh, didn't see. I saw some people that you trained on YouTube, but I wasn't finding you. However, now that we've done this interview, you will be on YouTube, so that'll be a place people will but there's find actually you. Demos that we're going to put out on YouTube very soon. We're actually okay. demonstrating people in trouble using each of these modalities. So if okay. that's not on YouTube yet, it will be soon. Stephen Vasquez, Dr. Stephen Vasquez, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio. Well, thank you so much, Dave. I appreciate you inviting me, and I hope this was helpful to somebody.